<clears throat> well, if you would open your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read for you these first three verses. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, notice something in these verses. The author is asking you all to do something that I know only a couple people in this auditorium like to do. That is run races. I know of, I know of one person in particular, my wife, who can be convinced to run a race with her friend, with her friends. I know another person in this auditorium who, who does enjoy the struggle and the agony of running races. I myself enjoy running races because it's always a, a competition against yourself to see if you have improved, to see if all the work that you have put in has, has gotten you somewhere. And then one time, somebody <clears throat> in our church texted me a proverb in a jest. And they say, a fool runs. Only a fool runs when nobody is chasing them. <laughs> I thought to myself, okay, now I see the general perspective on running. That may be the general perspective on physically running, but the author of Hebrews is challenging every person who wants to live for Christ to be engaged in running a race. That is the main point of these particular verses. And the author of Hebrews is writing to an audience who was on the fence about whether they wanted to be Christians or not. The author of Hebrews was communicating with people who weren't sure whether they wanted to continue following Christ or whether they wanted to go back and live as Jews and perform the Judaistic practices and traditions that they grew up with. And as you read through the book of Hebrews, you find that the author of Hebrews compares every single aspect of Judaism to Christ, and he concludes that Christ is far better. Christ is far greater Christ is a greater sustainer. Christ is a greater example. Christ is a greater high priest. Christ is a greater sacrifice. And so here, after going through all the ways that Christ is better than the Mosaic Law Covenant and what was established uh, in the book of Exodus for God's people, after going through all of that, the author of Hebrews in, ver er, in chapter 11 communicates that there is a cloud of witnesses who have gone before you and they endured many serious trials and you yourself should be willing to endure serious trials because of your faith. And so when we get to chapter 12, verse 1, the author of Hebrews says, Therefore, because of all that I've taught you and because of all these others who have gone before you, 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 dear reader, have a responsibility to lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us and to run with endurance the race that is set before you. And so if I was going to summarize this particular passage, I would summarize it with a question. And it's a question I want you to write down this morning. It's a question that you must answer for yourself. I can't answer it for you. And your friend can't answer it for you. And even though when we run physically, we often run with our friends because it's good motivation, this race you run by yourself, in a sense. And I'll explain that in a moment. But this race you run by yourself. It's you and Jesus. And here's the question that the author of Hebrews wants you to answer. Are you committed to running the race of faith? Are you committed to running the race of faith? Now, I don't care whether you've ever run in your life or not. 
That's not the type of running we're talking about here. The race of faith is a phrase that describes the journey that God, God himself, has elected us to and has called us to complete. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Paul is writing to the church, and he says this about God. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. You didn't ask to be invited to the race of faith. God did it for you. You didn't sign up to run this race. God signed you up. From before the foundation of the world, God knew who you were. And God predestined you to become conformed to the image of His Son. So whether you like it or not, you're in the race if you're God's child. You have a responsibility. And I think that the terminology or the term race, which is used here in Hebrews chapter 12 to describe the Christian life, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 to describe the Christian life, the word race is a, is a really excellent term because it communicates a lot of truths at the same time. And let me explain these things to you. First, a race is a specific event. So every year, uh, my wife and I and Rebecca Holland and a couple other people, we sign up to run a 5K race that happens in Lindsay, Ohio. 5K is, is 3.1 miles. All right. This is a specific event that we sign up to run. We seek it out. We run that race. Well, the race of faith is a specific event too. And the fact of the matter is there's only two types of races that you can be on in life. Jesus said there's a road or a path that is broad and the gate is wide and that race leads to destruction. But there is another road, there is another path that is narrow. The gate is narrow. And those who are on that path, the road leads to eternal life. So there's only two specific events that you could be a part of. And if God has chosen you to be a part of this event, then you are in the event. You're in the event. Now the word race also implies that there is a goal or a prize at the end of the event. I have received uh, numerous Uh, awards for being first or second in my age group, but then I'm like the only guy who's in my age group in these races. Okay, It's not because I'm a fast runner. It's because I'm the only one. But the fact of the matter is, in the race of faith, there is a goal or a prize. There is a crown that you will receive for running well. Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4 when he says to Timothy, I've completed my course and laid out for me, I'm about to receive the crown of glory for running the course well. So race is a specific event. Race implies that there is a goal or a prize. And then when you participate in a race, it is serious. And it requires your focus and your devotion and your self-discipline. Look, I like to run for exercise because I have a job that is a sit-down job. Running helps keep me healthy. But when I sign up for a race, my running goes to a different level. It becomes much more serious, much more focused. And I train for that specific event that I sign up for. And so, my friends, if you are in the race of faith... You have to be focused. You have to be devoted to that race. You have to practice and exercise self-discipline in all things because day in and day out, you are running this race. The word race also communicates more than just a jog. Okay? I go out for a jog. I go out for a run. If I'm not feeling great, you know what? I just stop and walk. No big deal. So I'm just by myself. But when I'm on race day and I'm signed up for that 4K, it doesn't matter how much my lungs hurt or my legs hurt or anything else in my body hurts, I am not stopping for anything. Because you're devoted to finishing. 
And so the word race also communicates that there is going to be a struggle that is painful in order to accomplish the goal at at hand. When you are part of the race of faith, there are going to be great struggles that you must be a part of. There will be disappointments. There will be discomfort. But you know what else happens in a race? There is joy and celebration when you complete the course. And so even in the midst of a race where it's not comfortable, there is joy, there is a sense of accomplishment, there is triumph at the victory that you will want achieve at the very end of that, that race. I would compare the race of faith more to a stage race than to a sprint. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with stage racing, stage racing would be like the Tour de France. It's a bicycle race. But for three weeks, there is a stage, and you get prepared every day to race a stage, and then the next day you race another stage, and the next day you race another stage, as opposed to a 100-meter sprint. You know, when you watch the Olympics and you see the guys do the 100 meters, it's 100 meters and you're done. The Christian race of faith is a stage race. It happens every single day from the moment of your salvation until God decides to take you home to glory, whether that's through the rapture or through death. And so day in and day out, you are participating in this stage race. Now, why does the author of Hebrew, why does the author of Hebrews uh, talk about this race of faith in these terms? Well, he understands that there are members in the audience who are on the fence about whether they want to be in the race or not. He knows that some of them are considering turning back. But some of them are considering to press forward. He wants them to understand the exact consequences, the exact nature of the struggle. He wants to provide encouragement and challenge at the same time, and that's why This is addressed to both believers and unbelievers. In this particular chapter, uh, there might have been some unbelievers who were listening to these words, people who were on the fence. That's why a little bit later on, he says, today is the day of salvation. If you're not in the race, get in the race. Today is the day. Today is the day. And the purpose of the way he has phrased and set up the argument is to make every person who is listening answer the question, am I really and truly committed to running the race of faith? These verses are both a challenge to get in the race if you're not in it, and also an exhortation that if you're in the race, keep persevering, keep doing well. Now let's take a look at the text. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we find out that there is preparation that needs to be made for the race. There is preparation. The first step of preparation, obviously, is being in the race. How do you get in the race? Well, if you're not in the race, you get in the race by recognizing that you're a sinner and you're under the condemnation of God. That your sins have a consequence, and the consequence is eternal death. And you will experience that eternal death if you don't repent from your sins and trust in Jesus. Again, the whole point of the book of Hebrews, Jesus is better than everything. He's better than the Mosaic Law. He's better than works. He's better than your own uh, personal moral standards. Jesus is it, and he is the one perfect true sacrifice. And so if you're not in the race, you need to decide to get in the race by repenting of your sins and putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Again, I will say it. Today is the day of salvation. If you're here this morning and you're not in the race, don't leave here without knowing whether you're in the race or not. Don't do it. So that's the first preparation, is get in the race. But let's assume for just a moment that 100% of the people in this auditorium are in the race. 100% of this audience is in the race. What do we do? We've been in the race for a while. What is the author of Hebrews telling us to do? 
First, we need to prepare ourselves for the race. We prepare ourselves for the race by looking at the others who have gone before us. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, there is a cloud of witnesses who is referenced by the author. This cloud of witnesses is all the faithful men and women that you have known before. And here in Hebrews chapter 11, it is faithful men and women whose stories we find out about in the Old Testament. But it doesn't have to be just those people. You can think about people in your life who ran the race of faith well and finished well. You should look to their example. Consider their example. Don't quit. Because what you're facing right now is probably not worse than what these other people have faced. And that's true as the author of Hebrews describes some of the persecutions faced by men and women of old. Verse 37 of Hebrews chapter 11 says this, They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Well, that doesn't sound too attractive. But that's the price of being in the race. That's part of the struggle. And if those people who went before us could endure the struggle, then you, my friends, you can endure the struggle. So we are to look at the witnesses who have gone before us. That is to encourage our hearts. The second preparation that we make in the race of faith is to lighten our load and to prepare to run. Now, when I run, I definitely do not run in a sport coat and a tie. I do not. I mean, if I had to, I would. And it looks great in the movies. But let me tell you what, it is very uncomfortable after about 50 yards. Okay? So when I go to run, I try to put on the clothing that is that makes it as easy as possible for me to move my body. All right? It's lightweight. It's breathable, so I don't get overheated. It, it's specially designed for running. And in the same way, if you're going to run the ways of faith, you need to prepare yourself. And you need to take off, here's what the author says, take off every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles you. There's a, the, the metaphor here is when you get ready to run a race, you don't run in heavy clothing. You take off those encumbrances. What does that mean in the spiritual life, though? What does that mean in the spiritual realm? Well, I think the author of Hebrews is referring to two distinct things here. Every encumbrance is a reference. Every encumbrance is a reference to those things which are not necessarily sinful, but which prevent you from running your race well. And then the second half of that is the sin which so easily entangles. So he is making a reference to sin. Sin hinders your race of faith. But he's also making a reference to encumbrances. These are any impediments impediments that get in the way of running well. I don't think they're sins. I think there are various aspects of life that take your focus off the race. Let me give you some examples of encumbrances. Work. Work is an encumbrance. It's necessary, but it can also be an encumbrance. It can distract you from the race of faith. Our material possessions can be an encumbrance to us. I remember uh, when I first moved to Ohio 17 years ago, everything I owned fit into a Honda Civic. And man, life was a lot simpler because you could pick up and go wherever you wanted to. I didn't have to spend a lot of time doing maintenance or chores. But now that I have a house and four children and two automobiles, man, my material possessions that I just need to survive require a lot of time and attention to maintain. You can allow your material possessions to be an encumbrance to your race of faith. They're good to have. They're not sinful. But they can become an encumbrance to the race of faith. So think about that when you're getting ready to 
uh, own various things or make various purchases, what is the time commitment that this material possession is going to require from me? Another example of encumbrances are personal dreams or hopes or goals that don't necessarily align with the Great Commission. We can have personal dreams. That's not bad. We can have personal goals. That's not bad. But when those personal dreams and personal goals get in the way of our running the race of faith, we need to reprioritize. We need to set those things aside so that our race of faith is not encumbered by those personal dreams and goals. Finally, something that you may not even consider, family and family life and family obligations can be an encumbrance to running the race of faith. Look, this is so true. You all know this. Your family is one of the biggest blessings God has given you, and it's also one of the biggest challenges to navigate. Why? Jesus says you have to love me more than you love father or mother, sister or brother. That is not always an easy task, especially when your family is encouraging you to do sinful things or when your family themselves have decided to commit sinful actions, and you have to turn away from your family. You have to make a choice. Do I serve Jesus, or do I maintain my family ties? These are all examples of encumbrances, and we could probably go around this room and find many more. The author of Hebrews commands us to lay aside these encumbrances. We need to put them off of us. Just like I would take off my coat and tie if I was going to go run. But then he gets to a deeper issue. Put off the sin which so easily entangles. We know that sin is missing the mark of God's holy and perfect standard. And so if you are going to run well, you cannot be encumbered by sin. You cannot have sins that you don't deal with hanging around in your life. There can be many sins that you're struggling with. There could be many sins that you are tempted to perform or, or that you are trying to break the habit of. But we need to recognize that our sin misses God's standard and it is an encumbrance to us pursuing Christ-likeness. And in this particular passage, based upon the context of the book of Hebrews, I think the chief sin that the author of Hebrews is dealing with is the sin of doubt or unbelief. Right? Because the temptation for these people was to turn away from Christ and turn back to their old lifestyle. And so what? They were doubting God. They were doubting Jesus. They were doubting God's promises. Unbelief has caused many runners to quit races or to slow down and walk. It has caused many people to give up their goals. Unbelief is so powerful that it has caused many people to not even start a race. I could never do that. I could never run a 5K. Well, if you have that attitude, you'll never will run a 5K. The difference between I could never run a 5K and I could never run the race of faith is that most of these people were already on the race because God called them chose them, predestined them, justified them, and is in the process of sanctifying them. And they're in the race whether they want to be or not. They're in the race because God has placed them there. And if you have been placed in the race by God, but you are allowing doubt and unbelief to hinder your running, you need to repent of that. And you need to ask God to give you strength to have faith. Ask God to give you strength to have belief. Ask God to help you trust in Jesus. There are many so-called believers who have stopped running after Jesus because running is hard if you're not totally committed. And like the parable of the sower explains to us, there are many, many things that will creep up in your life and become more interesting, more exciting, that will seem more important, than continuing on in the race of faith.
So you need to lighten your load and you need to prepare to run. Finally, the third stage of preparation is to commit to the race. Look down at verse 1 again. The author of Hebrews says, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You must commit to the race. As I've already mentioned, you're in the race. So if you're already in the race, just do it. Don't waffle. Don't be on the fence. Don't have one foot in and one foot out. Just run the race with endurance. Endurance is sticking to something, even though it's hard. Endurance is finishing what you start. Endurance is one of the hallmark values of the Christian life. When you read through the characteristics that should um, be typical in the life of a Christian, endurance is always mentioned. Yet, endurance is often one of the most difficult disciplines to work on because it requires that day after day after day effort. And sometimes if you fail two or three days in a row or maybe two or three weeks in a row, you look at the situation that you're in and you think, well, what's the point anymore? I've already failed so much. Why should I keep going? Well, you should keep going because God has placed you in this race. And one week of failure or one month of failure or one even year of failure is not enough to disqualify you from the race. It's not enough to allow you to say, well, I'm kind of tired of this. I'm, I'm going to check out now. Dr. MacArthur says this about running the race with endurance. Many Christians could hardly be described as running the race at all. Some are merely jogging. Some are walking slowly. And some are sitting or even lying down. Yet the biblical standard for holy living is a race not a morning devotional. Race is the Greek word agon, from which we get agony. A race is not a thing of passive luxury, but it is demanding. It is sometimes grueling and agonizing, and it requires our utmost in self-discipline, in determination, and in perseverance. Look, maybe you're here this morning, friend, and you're like, wow, I've checked out of the race. Well, this is your encouragement from the Holy Spirit to check back in. Get back into the race. Start running again. Start again. And here's what's interesting. This is an open-ended race. Unlike a 5K or a 10K or a marathon that has a defined distance, you are to run the race that is set before you. We don't know how long that is going to be. You don't know how many days that you will have on this earth to make an impact for the kingdom of God. But while you are on this earth and while you are in the race, you have the opportunity to make an impact that lasts for eternity on the kingdom of God. So we may have tomorrow, we may have 10 years, we may have 40 years. It is an indeterminate amount of time, only known by God himself. But you run the race that is set before you. I can't run your race and you can't run my race. I need to run the race that is set before me. Your race will last as long as you last. Whether God gives you 20 more years or 20 more days. That's why it's imperative that you do the best that you can day after day after day to run the race. Because once the race is over, there's no opportunities to go back and do differently. That's it. It's over. It's done. I've thought about that in my own races. You know, if I would have done X differently, I could have shaved 20 seconds off. Maybe I should have started sprinting a little bit earlier. Hindsight is 2020. But in this race, you don't have the opportunity to evaluate your performance and then redo it again after it's all said and over. No, in this race, 
you have a responsibility to do your best day in and day out because once the race is over, the race is done. Now, this seems very hard and challenging. There's a lot of preparation that needs to be done for an open-ended race. And the author of Hebrews understands and knows that what he's asking the readers to do is difficult. And so in the very next verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, he gives them some encouragement. He wants to point to the inspiration for the race. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the inspiration for the race. There is a runner that you should follow in this race. Look at, verse, uh, look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The inspiration for the race that we are running is none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. And when you're running, if you're not a runner, you, you may not understand this. Here's, the, here's what you do when you're a runner. You have to keep your eyes focused only on the path in front of you because you need to avoid potholes or sticks that may have fallen across the path or other obstacles that are in the way. Furthermore, it's difficult to run in a straight line when your head is turning to the, le to the right or to the left. You get distracted easily. And so when you're running, you have to have a fixed focal point. And here's one thing that I know from all my years of racing when you're really struggling in the race, if you can make the focal point a short distance ahead of you and say, if only I can get to this point, and then you get there. If only I can get to the next point, and then you get there. You have these small victories in the midst of a bigger race, and it helps you across the finish line. That's exactly what the author of Hebrews is encouraging the readers to do. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. Don't look to the right don't look to the left. Don't look anywhere else. Just keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Like Peter, when he got out of the boat, when his eyes were focused on Jesus, he was walking on the water. When he took his eyes off of Jesus and saw the waves and the wind, he began to sink. Look, all these stories are in the Word of God to help us understand what our focus needs to be, and our focus needs to be on Jesus Christ. When you're running, you have to have a fixed focal point, and for us, Jesus is the focal point. Now, why Jesus? Look at what he's done for us. Jesus is the focal point because of what he's done. Verse, uh, verse 2, Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. You think, oh, I'm running this race of faith. I don't even know how it's going to go. Yes, you do. Because you've watched Jesus run the race. And you saw how it went for Jesus. And you know that it ends in glorification. And you know that it ends in triumph. So Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. Author has the idea of being a pioneer. In other words, Jesus blazed a trail of faith for us to follow. And he is the perfecter of faith because he showed that it's possible to be faithful to the very end until the course is completed. What was Jesus' continual prayer during his life? Lord, not my will be done, but Father, let your will be done. He blazed the trail of faith by demonstrating that you could keep your focus on God the Father and on the will that God the Father has revealed to you. And we all have an advantage even over Jesus, because we have the Word of God completed in our laps, in our tablets, in our smartphones. We have it easily accessible. And so there should be no doubt as to what the will of God is for our lives. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith because he blazed the trail. And where did that trail lead? It led for Jesus to the cross where he would complete the work of redemption that he and God the Father planned prior to the beginning of the creation of this world. Before, before the heavens were made, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit came up with a plan of redemption. And so Jesus 
ran the race of faith, and he ran it all the way to the cross because that is the culmination of God's plan of redemption. And it says he joyfully endured the cross. That doesn't mean the cross was fun, but it means that Jesus understood that his suffering on the cross would bring great joy. And so the end, the end of the event was much more significant than the suffering experienced along the way. And we need to remember that. The end of our race will be much more glorious, much greater than we can possibly imagine. And it will make every, every moment of suffering seem so much more insignificant than what we thought at the initial time. Because there will be glory at the end. There will be glory. Jesus despised the shame. This is a reference to <clears throat> not only how anybody who was hung on a tree was cursed under the Mosaic law, but he also despised the, the shame from those who mocked him, who told him that he was worthless, who made fun of him, uh, who persecuted him, he didn't care about what they had to say because he understood what God the Father had to say. And he understood what the Word of God said and the end purpose and goal. And so he even despised the shame. He was willing to endure all kinds of ill treatment because of the end goal. And that's what happened. <clears throat> that's what happened. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God when the author of Hebrew says he sits down at the right hand. That's a way to describe finishing your work. Or you finish your work. Um, in our society, you know, we, we have a lot of sit-down jobs, a lot of office jobs, and so it doesn't quite communicate the same thing. But if you've ever been a, like, um, just a day laborer, if you've ever done construction work or agricultural work, uh, especially in the time in which this was written, you stood up, and you worked all day long standing. And then at the end of the day, when you finished your work, you would come back into your house and you would sit down and you, you were finished for the day. Your work was completed for that day. And that's exactly what the image is here. Jesus' work on the cross was a one-time only event. And in that one event, he finished the plan and the purpose and the goal of redemption. He finished it all by paying for the price of all of our sins, by bearing the wrath of God against sin. And so after God raised him from the dead, and then Jesus appeared to his disciples for those 40 days, and when he ascended into heaven, he sat down because the work that he set out to do was finished. Jesus made it to the end of his race. You will make it to the end of your race. Keep running. And that's how the author of Hebrews ends this particular section. He wants you to prepare for the race. He gives you the inspiration for the race, which is to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And then he wants you to persevere in the race. Verse 3, Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. When you get tired... When the race seems overwhelming, when it seems like the suffering is more than you can endure or bear, you are to consider Jesus. The author of Hebrews is aware that some of his readers are tired of running the race. They're ready to give up. But he says, you know what? Don't give up. Consider Jesus. Why? Jesus endured great hostility by sinners against himself. Think about it. Satan himself came to Jesus to try to get Jesus to deviate from God's plan. The Pharisees mocked Jesus at every single turn. Jesus' own brothers and sisters didn't believe that he was the Son of God. Everywhere Jesus turned, there was opposition to him. So I, I don't know if you know what a steeplechase is, but Jesus' race was more like a steeplechase. That's one of those races where you have to run through the woods and jump over logs and over, over uh, pits of mud, and you have to climb up obstacles and go down other obstacles. 
Jesus ran a difficult race with obstacles in front of him, around him, at every single turn. And yet he endured. So we look at Jesus and we see that he endured hostility by sinners against himself. And so we ought not to allow sinners to stop us from running the race as well. Look, you, you have perhaps unsafe family members, unsafe friends, uh, other people in your life who would mock you or, or make fun of you for running the race of faith. Don't allow them to derail you or to discourage you in your race. Just run. Just run. Jesus says, or the author of Hebrews says, if you keep your eyes focused on Jesus, if you consider what Jesus had to endure, then you yourself will not grow weary or lose heart. Meditating on what Jesus suffered and his ultimate victory and his endurance to overcome helps us when we are tempted to quit. Look, the sin-cursed world that we are living in is overwhelming. Perhaps it's our own personal sin and the heartbreaks that we have brought upon ourselves by our own disobedience that make us want to quit the race. But don't do that. Don't do that. We are to not grow weary. We are to not lose heart. We are to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and we are to stay engaged in the race. Sometimes we are tempted to give up and wonder, what is this all for? You know that believers have experienced that. Go read some of the Psalms of lament that King David wrote when he was hiding in a cave, fearing for his life as Saul was chasing him. Imagine, here's David, anointed to be king at 16 or 17 years old, goes to serve in the king's court for a year to two, two years, and then he's chased out of the king's court, and then the king decides that there should be a nationwide manhunt to get this guy. You think David was tempted to be angry at God? God, why would you even anoint me king and then let me suffer all of this? Well, the purpose was so that we could see David's endurance through the race of faith. And so that as David penned those poems, those prayers that we know of as psalms, that we could, in our deepest and darkest moments, go to those and be comforted, knowing that you're not the only one who has faced a heartbreaking trial or challenge. In addition to the challenges that we face in our lives that are brought about by sin, we are also challenged by the encumbrances that we pick up as life goes on. We need to remind ourselves, sometimes our encumbrances, which are blessings from God, can be a distraction to running the race. Maybe we need to pare down. Maybe we need to cut back. Let's make sure that the goods of this world and the blessings that we enjoy don't become a stumbling block to serving God. We should not lose heart. That's how the author of Hebrews ends these, this particular paragraph. Let us not lose heart. This reminded me of Isaiah's words in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired his understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. And though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain a new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run, and they will not get tired. They will walk, and they will not become weary. Look, the race that you are running right now has been run by millions of faithful believers before you. And when you have no strength to run, then you, give, you ask God to give you the strength. God will give you the strength 
to run the race. But you know what? You have to be committed to run. And that's the question. That's the opening question. That's the closing question. Are you committed to running the race of faith? We see here that if you're a believer in Christ, you're in the race. How's your run? Are you doing well? Or do you need to change some things up? I hope this morning that no matter what you're going through, whether you're at the peak right now or whether you're in the lowest valley, that you don't give up on the race of faith, but that if you're weary and burdened, you fix your eyes upon Jesus and you ask the Lord to renew your strength because he will do so and he will give you the grace that you need to put one foot in front of the other. Let's pray.